Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending from where in the world you're connecting from. My name is Peter Detender, Azure Technical Trainer at Microsoft in Redmond, and I'm going to walk you through some cool topic today, talking about achieving SRE Site Resiliency Engineering using Azure products. This session is part of the amazing, awesome Azure Back to School idea from Dwayne and Derek. So thanks for that too, guys, um, for having me once more. This is my um, third year in a row where I always like to share my uh, passion for Azure for the platform, integrating a little bit on DevOps and slightly integrating a little bit on site resiliency engineering as well. That's what we're going to do. If you want to stay in touch or you should have any questions by watching this video, feel free to connect on Twitter. That's PDTIT. If you want to follow my technical blog, it's aka.ms slash pdtit and petender at microsoft.com if you want to send me questions by email. So what are we going to do in the next hour or so? Touching on mm, three prime topics. The first one is explaining what is a SRE, Site Resiliency Engineering, sometimes called Site Reliability Engineering, so mainly clarifying a little bit on the terminology because it could be a little bit confusing every now and then. From there, jumping into more technical topics, how to achieve reliability using the Azure platform, meaning how to build, run reliable, resilient, business critical workloads on the Azure platform. Then closing with DevOps as a means for SRE. It's not a replacement, it's not exactly the same, but they're nicely working together. And then typically in Peter sessions, that's what my session description said, I'm going to walk you through a couple of demos to mix the lecture with um, some real insights. A bit about myself, not too crucial, I would say, but sometimes it could be relevant and interesting to know um, who's like presenting. So my name, Peter, you might recognize a little European accent there where I lived in Belgium for about 46 years and only seven, eight months back, moved to the Redmond area, continuing my job as an Azure technical trainer within the Microsoft West US team, and also part of the Cloud Advocate team in some sort of V-team um, role. So I'm helping them out. I'm collaborating wherever I can because I do love Azure and advocacy and site resiliency engineering and DevOps. I hope that's becoming clear, but I'm not officially part of that team. So that's where the V-team um, naming comes from. Overall, been working in Microsoft World, Microsoft Technologies for about 26 years out of which I was 12 years a Microsoft certified trainer, actually a little bit longer, but got my certification only 12 years back and was an Azure MVP for five years before I moved to Microsoft about three years ago. Last um, nine to 10 years, heavily focused on Azure, starting from consulting, implementing, architecting, and as you could figure out in meantime, focusing a lot more on the readiness side, the sharing knowledge um, side of the job role. Technical writer, that's um, a little bit of the, I would say the logos for the different books. Over the years, um, I found a hobby in writing technical books, mainly when we were still traveling before the pandemic, where it was like probably one of the easiest jobs, uh, sorry, hobbies I could take with me. Um, writing books for packed for publishers, um, a press for uh, Microsoft internal as well in meantime. So um, if you're interested in getting one of those or you want to get some insights, I would say um, hold on tight till the end of the session and I might show you a little surprise there. Good, enough about me. It's about time to jump in the technical topic, right? So the first module is what is SRE? SRE refers to Site Reliability Engineering or Site Reliability um, Engineer, depending if you're talking about the, the service, the concept, or if you're talking about the job role, like as an engineer. Reliability reflects the, the guarantee of running an application as available as needed for your business requirements. So we're not talking about 100% high availability anymore. We're not talking about ultimate resiliency anymore. It's about what is important for the business, but more on that later on. And then the engineering part is obviously also applying to the concepts, principles of using computer science and engineering to build, maintain your systems and applications all the way from source control, developing, running pipelines into the monitoring operations part. Now, why, now you know what SRE is about. What is an SRE engineer? Like what is the SRE person or team doing, right? 
So overall, as an SRE, so a site reliability engineer, you guarantee workload reliability. That's your responsibility within your organization. Now, to make that possible, you need to focus on finding ways to improve the design, optimizing architecture, as well as optimizing, improving how you're going to operate the systems, making them more scalable, more reliable, and running them efficiently. The site in SRE, as a definition, reflects services, I think, or, or it's not just that I think about it. I, I'm quite sure that it should reflect services now. And it's pointing towards the systems you're going to manage. And they're typically running in a massive data center at scale or sometimes even global scale. What I picked up, um, by the way, site reliability engineering was um, originally coined by um, the Google team where they needed to make sure that, for example, the Google website was always up and running. Now, a funny side story there that I picked up from attending um, any of those sessions was that the site itself was not only used by Google to identify like how reliable the, the search engine was, but it's also one of the, the first website that anyone would connect to to validate, for example, your internet connection. Imagine you're uh, deploying a new Wi-Fi router at home or you're connecting um, to some public hotspot, then apparently one of the, the first websites you're trying to connect to is the google.com website. So if that website would be down, it might give you the impression that something's wrong with your internet connection, where technically it might not be related to that. So that was a funny side story there. Moving on with the role of the SRE. So the nice thing is that it's it's a pretty challenging, um, interesting role to be in because it's, it's a mix of everything. Sometimes the task as an SRE is writing software, like being a developer for large scale workloads. Sometimes you're totally on the other side of the table where your task is shifting to building additional pieces of software on top of the already existing software you're developing. But now it's not really deploying an application, building um, or developing an application, but everything around it. So that's focusing on deploying backup, interacting, high availability, load balancers, the monitoring part, everything that makes sure that, again, your workload is running optimized. And then sometimes your task is also figuring out how to apply existing solutions to new problems. And that's where specifically the engineering mindset comes into play. Now, another question that um, I do get in, in a lot of Azure um, DevOps, mainly workshops I'm doing, together with Azure Architecting Workshops, is what's the difference between DevOps and SRE? Is SRE like DevOps 2.0? Meaning it's an optimized version, it's a replacement of the DevOps automated pipeline culture that we've been using over the last couple of years. Now, if you look at the, the core definition of DevOps, it tries to integrate, embrace that culture of bringing developers, operations teams, and actually a lot more into um, the team collaboration, like really gluing them together, making sure that everybody understands what's the, um, the purpose, what's the goal, and in the end, the goal is delivering more value to the business by using automated workflows, by using pipelines. I'm not talking about any specific tool here. It's not about Azure DevOps. It's about the DevOps concept. Where SRE, the site reliability engineering, is 100% relying on DevOps practices. Why? Because DevOps gives you everything from source control in between pipelines all the way to operations. Where SRE, you could say, is like an extension of DevOps. So you're going to work towards optimizing reliability. Now, without DevOps, there would not be SRE. On the other side, SRE is not a replacement for DevOps, but mainly an augmentation of that. Good. There's a bit more in the definition, the terminology, so allow me to move on here. Now, once you know what SRE is about, it's about running high available workloads as high available as required for your business. But what does it mean, right? Now, what it means is you need to measure. So how can you measure the SRE success? There's a whole bunch of definitions there. I focused on four important ones. SLO, SLI, RTO, and RPO. What is SLO? Service level objective. It points towards what is the target reliability for my workload. It's not about we need to get 100% high availability. It's not about we need to get high availability for all workloads. You're going to focus on each and every workload individually, and you're going to define, discuss together with the business, what is the ultimate reliability that we need for this kind of workload. 
or maybe some kind of platform target as well. SLI, the service level indicators, defining what is the correct percentage of reliability target, meaning the business could ask for 100% high availability, but maybe there is no specific need to do that. So in the SLO, you're gonna work towards the target. In the SLI, you're gonna identify if that target is actually making sense. And then during the lifetime of your workload, you have RTO and RPO. RTO stands for recovery time objective, meaning how long does it take before the workload is operational again? And it's not just about the technical time, it could also include um, the, the time of notification, the time of detecting. So there's a, a few, I would say, site definitions that could move towards RTO. And then last here, RPO recovery point objective is referring to the point that allows you to recover to. So easy example, how much data loss do we potentially have? And it's a combination of all four. So you're gonna define for each and every workload, how crucial, how important is it for the business, not just for having it running, but really where the, the business goal comes in. Does that make sense? Where the business is gonna ask you for the full 100%, where you might need to convince them that the full 100% doesn't make a lot of sense, or there's no need to do that, or it could be quite complex from an architectural perspective to achieve that 100%. So that's what we're aiming for. We're not done yet because within the SRE definition, there's also um, four other ones that I would like to highlight. MTTF, mean time to failure, like how long does it take before we face an outage? Mean time between failure, how long does it take before we have another failure about similar or totally different from the first one we had? And then mean time to recover, mean time to repair, MTTR obviously points at how long it actually takes before your application, before the workload, before the system is back in business. And then last, MTTA, mean time to acknowledge, is that gap, I would say, in between the recovery time objective, recovery time, um, recovery point objective, allowing you to identify what time do you need before you actually find out that there is an outage. And it's not about pinpointing anyone, but obviously if you don't have the 24 seven monitoring services running, if you don't have alerts defined, if you don't have notifications defined, it might actually take a little bit longer. On top of that, you might actually detect the outage, but maybe your um, escalation process is rather complex slash rather time consuming, meaning that you're still losing crucial minutes before you can actually take an action and recovering the problem. So again, quite some interesting definitions there. Now, one of the, the, the main goals I think is, is monitoring, right? So allow me to show you an easy example running Grafana, which is available as a dashboarding service. You can deploy it yourself. You could spin up a container or you could run it um, out of Grafana Cloud together with Grafana as a hosted service on the Azure platform. Now, Grafana works nicely together with Prometheus, where Prometheus is the typical monitoring target tool, the metric tool, you could say, that's capturing all metrics from a Kubernetes um, clustered container orchestration environment. So the typical bundle would be Prometheus together with Grafana, where Prometheus is grabbing all the metrics, and you're going to use Grafana to read out um, the actual metrics and representing them in some nice, useful, cool looking demo uh, dashboards. That's what I'm gonna show you in my next demo. So in this demo, I'm gonna start with a quick overview of uh, Kubernetes AKS clustered environment. Not too much on the Kubernetes side itself, but mainly focusing on the reporting out of Prometheus and Grafana, obviously. So what I am running here is my cluster. So I deployed a pretty straightforward Azure Kubernetes environment and it's running here. And within my Kubernetes, I can validate a bunch of namespaces where I have my default namespace. That's where I'm running my actual workload. I got a few cube system public namespaces. That's like the, the system resources for the Kubernetes cluster itself. And the other thing I have is a monitoring namespace. Inside the monitoring namespace, I'm running a collection of containers based on Grafana workloads and 
Prometheus workloads. If you don't know how to do that, um, I would say there's a whole bunch of documentation available on the internet, how to install Kubernetes, how to install Prometheus, how to run your um, container environment. Let me just go back because it's not in the correct space here. So this is a, a little bit better. What you can see inside the monitoring section is over here, a whole collection of standalone services. We're obviously under the hood of the services, it's running different uh, container pods. So there is Prometheus integration, Prometheus services, the operator is like the, the engine, the intelligence. Optionally, there's an alert manager. If something goes wrong on the Kubernetes side, that obviously you can receive some alerts. And my demo app, that's the little application I'm running. That's mainly it. So the next step is how do I connect to my Prometheus, right? So once um, your Prometheus is running, you need to run a little port forwarding. So what I did for the Grafana containers as well as the Prometheus containers is over here, kubectl, let me change a different color, there we go. So kubectl, namespace connecting to the monitoring namespace and read out all the pods belonging to that um, Prometheus environment. Or if you wanna get a view on all of them, it would just be kubectl where you're gonna read out the namespace monitoring and get pods. And that's literally the exact same output as what I showed you before. And then once you know that your containers are up and running, that's where the port forwarding comes in over here. So again, using kubectl or kube control, you're gonna connect to the namespace monitoring and executing a port forwarding from the Prometheus Kubernetes service to port 9090. And here in the backend, I'm doing the same for Grafana, where this time I'm connecting to port 3000. You could choose the random port, obviously, but the defaults would be 9090 for Prometheus and 3000 for Grafana. The outcome of that is two dashboards Prometheus dashboard, where you can play a little bit with um, reading out the configuration if you're interested in the YAML snippet behind, it's kind of extensive, or validating the services, that's what I typically validate, where it's connecting to the different containers running inside my cluster, which are offering the alerts, offering Grafana, offering Prometheus, right? And then the same for Kubernetes, where it's um, building up a dashboard. Now, since I talked about SLOs, SLIs, this is what I like about reading out over here, reading out the Kubernetes API server, and it allowed me to build up some SLAs, SLIs, read-write operations. That's the main message. I got a few other dashboards, actually quite a lot of them, and this is all based on um, documentation, open uh, JSON files if you want, allowing you to easily import your Grafana dashboards. So for example, if I wanna get a view on my namespaces, the default, remember that's the one where my demo app is running. It's not running too long since I only uh, deployed this for the demo recording, but you can see it's nicely showing the CPUs, it's nicely showing memory, and a little bit further I can see that my demo app is based on um, five running pods over here, the exact same that I could see from my Azure portal dashboard and overall a little bit on the bandwidth. And, and so much more, right? But I hope this is good enough to give you an idea about um, what you can get out of your Kubernetes environment using Prometheus and Grafana for the dashboard representation. Awesome, that worked. Now, the again, don't focus too much on the fact that it was related to um, a container slash Kubernetes demo, you could reuse Prometheus and uh, the Grafana dashboarding tool, reporting tool for a lot of other workloads as well. But let me move on and touching a bit more on achieving reliability, achieving SRE on the Azure platform. Because now we know like it's all about high availability, it's about reliability. What are the, the, the characteristics, the toolings, the mechanisms, the services that we have available in the Azure platform, allowing us to work towards ultimate reliability? 
Now, overall, Azure is shared responsibility. What it means is you as a consumer, you're going to use the Azure platform. You're going to integrate your cloud services. But under the hood, Microsoft is giving you access to their platform. If you look at security, if you look at high availability, you probably need to work together. And then ultimately, you're going to integrate your workloads, your systems, your applications on top of the Azure Foundation, like everything I would say that is available, giving you the Azure services, but something that you cannot really touch on, like the, the physical data center together with the physical network, the components, the identity tools. That's what I'm talking about. Next to that, you're going to integrate your cloud services. You're going to reuse the ones that um, Microsoft is offering. If you're going to run virtual machines, web applications, containers, there's a whole bunch of available services and you need to decide which one is helping you achieving that ultimate high availability that you can use for your workloads. And then back to the monitoring part, because again, without monitoring, you have no real idea how healthy your services are running, meaning you cannot really decide if the workload is running healthy. And that's where we have Azure Service Health. Azure Service Health exists in, in basically two different flavors. There's one overall Azure Status Dashboard that I'll show you in the next demo, where Azure Status gives you the overall health of the platform, meaning which region might be impacted or more specific out of the 200 plus Azure services, do we recognize any of those services being down? Like Azure Backup is not available for a while. Azure Storage is not available. Azure Web Apps Engine is not available, those kind of scenarios. So it's not always a full region that's becoming unavailable. But on the other side, cloud is not 100% high available. And it's not just about Azure having some weakness there. It's the same for AWS, same for Google Cloud, the same for Ocean, Oracle Cloud, any cloud vendor is facing about the same issue where it is quite challenging to keep your workloads up and running already from that foundation. Then within Service Health, you can customize the views and you can drill down on the lowest level. That would be the Resource Health, where the main difference between Azure Status and Service Health is that Azure Status is allocating showing you the view of all Azure services out of that foundational layer. Once you move to resource health, it's going to show you the specifics for your Azure tenant, your Azure subscriptions. So the easy example, if something is wrong in, let's say, an APAC region localized um, Azure data center, but within your Azure subscriptions, you're only using West US, then out of Azure status, you're going to find out if you go over to the website and checking, but we're not going to give you any alerts specifically for your subscriptions because you don't have anything running in the APEC region. So let's switch to another demo and showing you what it looks like from the higher level status.azure.com all the way down to individual resource health, reflecting on your specific subscription. So right now it's all about Azure status, right? So you connect to status.azure.com from the browser. And what it gives you is, as mentioned, a real-time overview. It refreshes, I think, by design every two minutes where it's going to show you the actual state of each and every region where you can select the different regions here on top, including non-regional like global services being um, Azure Virtual Desktop, uh, Microsoft Graph, um, Traffic Manager, Azure Front Door, those kind of services. And in between, you can filter on Europe, you can filter on um, the different regions. So a little bit up, I can switch to Asia Pacific, specific Azure Government Cloud or the Americas. And then within, obviously for each and every service, it's gonna show you the actual uptime. And you could go like, okay, Peter, you show me that everything is green. But as you probably know, if you've been using Azure for a while, you know that every now and then it is not all green. Luckily, the outages are typically not taking too long, which also means that you should not always have too much impact. Apart from the overall status, um, you can click on Azure Service Health. And what it's going to do here is filtering information specifically for your tenant, your subscriptions. So what I can do here is reading out the different subscriptions that I have, filtering on the different regions and filtering on specific services. 
And again, this is mapping with everything you're running inside your Azure environment. One example here, but it's the same. Um, as you could see from the previous status health, there are no service issues right now. So I cannot show you any demo on this level. So the whole globe is nicely green as it should be, I think. But there's always something I can highlight in planned maintenance. So what is planned maintenance? It's where the Azure backend is running um, backend updates, physical storage, physical network components, physical server components, um, running Windows updates, Linux updates on the backend. That's um, all part of the planned maintenance. So what we define here is the issue or the information. It's not always, uh, I would say, a real issue. It's just uh, informational where you can download a PDF document. You can track a little bit on your mobile app, meaning you don't have to watch over the screen the whole time. And you could also configure alerts. Like it's cool to have that trace, but I only want to get specific alerts um, regarding specific services in a region as part of a specific subscription. The other nice thing where you don't have to watch over the portal all the time is that you could run the same from within your um, command line. So there is a comment and I don't have it in my slides, but allow me to quickly walk you through. So there is a AZ graph query allowing you to connect to the Azure resource graph where you're going to query. So the minus Q, you're going to query the service health resources where, and this is basically custo query language where you can define similar to what you would use in Azure log analytics, by the way, where you would use um, the specific events. So in this case, I'm reading out pretty much everything knowing that there is no service issue. So it's um, typically going to show me the, the planned maintenance as um, I sh as I already showed you in the portal itself. But you don't have to use the Azure portal. You could easily run this somewhere offsite in your Azure CLI on-prem. Obviously, you could use um, Azure PowerShell to do the same. Maybe interacting with resource graph APIs, importing it into your own custom monitoring tool if you would not use Azure Monitor. That's the idea. Good. Now, I told you this was a little bit more technical, but I actually need to go back to the definitions in, in the first part of the session where I did not touch on SLAs. I'm pretty sure if you would ask anyone, what does it mean to work high available? What is the definition coming to mind? In 99.9% .9 out of the cases, it would be SLA. Now, the reason why I'm moving out the SLA is because an SLA in its own service level agreement is not referring to technical reliability. Think of it as a some sort of legal compliance instrument allowing you to measure and typically measuring when penalties are due. Now, the good news is for each and every Azure service that's available in the platform, we provide you the SLA overview. So you are in control up to a certain extent where you can choose different SLA topologies. So an easy example, virtual machines, you can deploy a virtual machine as a standalone VM. It de gets deployed in a resource group, gets deployed in West US, and you're going to run it. If there's something in the Azure Foundation, the Azure back backend, where the virtual machine might not be available because of planned maintenance on an Azure physical server or an Azure physical rack, the virtual machine will become unavailable for a certain luckily short amount of time, but it means there is downtime, right? We're now after a few seconds, the virtual machine comes up on another physical host and your VM, your application, your workload is back in business. If you don't want to have that kind of um, downtime, even if it's quite short, you need to decide between availability sets or availability zones. Availability sets are guaranteeing an SLA of 99.95, which means that potentially your virtual machine would still be done for about 20 minutes. If you don't like the 20 minutes potential downtime in a full month, you need to move up to availability zones. Technical difference between sets and zones is that a set is going to rely on multiple virtual machine deployments across different physical servers in the same uh, region, but across different physical racks in the same building, where availability zones are still deploying, again, a, a collection of at least two virtual machines or more, but also across different buildings in still the same region. If you want to make up 
for regional outages, it means that you have to deploy your workloads, virtual machines, web apps, databases, anything that you can run on the platform across different regions and optimizing the reliability from there. So as you could figure out by now, there's a lot more work to be done on the, the architecting side of running your workloads and not just focusing on the implementation of it. Now, one super crucial, super important um, guideline I can share here is the Azure Well-Architected Framework or WAF. What is Azure WAF? It's um, a guidance, a blueprint, you could say, coming from the Azure engineering teams. There's actually a specific team within the Azure engineering that focuses on well-architected framework. What you find inside the docs, I have the link over here, is reference architecture based on reference um, architectural designs, diagrams, visio diagrams, Azure template, bicep templates to optimize the, the automated deployment and primarily looking at optimizing five different pillars. Cost optimization, like bringing down the, the monthly consumption, operational excellence, integrating with performance efficiency, and then obviously reliability is the biggest component, I would say why I'm talking about it, and then closing with security. I don't have time to touch on all the characteristics, all the details, I would say go through the, the documentation yourself and map it with your um, need, the, the ones for your specific workloads. The other nice thing is that the well-architected framework allows you to go through an assessment where the assessment is um, a, a pretty extensive list of questions that you can answer. If you integrate it with your Azure subscription and tenant, it also allows you to read out information from your already running uh, workloads. And talking about already running workloads, it's actually an interesting one because you might be familiar with the cloud adoption framework as well, or CAF. Now, what's the difference between well-architected framework and cloud adoption framework? I would say the cloud adoption framework is typically targeted towards organizations, customers, partners, where you're looking into migrating, deploying a new workload on the cloud platform. So you're gonna adopt the cloud, you're not using it for the full potential yet. Where the well-architected framework is actually coming after the cloud adoption framework. Because at that time you're running workloads on Azure, you've been running them for a few weeks, a few months, maybe a few years. And now since you find out in Peter's session, you're gonna pick up and look at, are we actually running in a reliable way? Are we running in the optimized, most optimized, secured way? Can we find any uh, performance efficiency parameters? And lastly, can we do something around cost optimization as well? So it's cloud adoption framework for the new onboardings, well-architected framework for the already existing workloads. Now, in a nutshell, the summary of the well-architected framework from a best practices perspective is first of all telling you, and these are just some examples, you don't have to follow all of them. It obviously all depends on the workloads you're running, but at least try to deploy your workloads in zone aware services. Virtual machines are zone aware, web app app services are also zone aware in the meantime. Obviously, when you're deploying your workloads across different regions, you need to integrate a global load balancer. This could be Azure Traffic Manager or Azure Frontdoor as the nice reference examples. For specific virtual machine workloads, integrate disaster recovery using Azure Site Recovery, ASR, together with Azure Backup for virtual machines. For the underlying database services, not talking about the ones running in a VM, but um, Azure SQL, Cosmos DB, for example, would benefit from deploying redundant database services, meaning deploy them across different regions. In case of an Azure SQL database, it's going to be um, a primary and secondary copies where the primary is the read-write um, owner. In case of a Cosmos database, you can actually take it to the next level and not just replicating your Cosmos DB across different regions, but also allowing multi-region read-write and you need to define um, the database consistency level there. That's quite important. For other virtual uh, non-virtual machine workloads, think of Azure App Services, think of SQL Azure Databases, Cosmos DB, you can enable the integrated Azure Backup. For most of these, the service is already available. You just need to um, enable it, or sometimes 
not doing anything like in case of um, SQL and Cosmos, the backup is already there, but it still allows you to fine tune some of the retention settings or when you want to run the backup. Or from another level, you can integrate um, governance. Again, governance pointing towards the specific requirements for your organization, maybe your vertical industry, like HIPAA compliance, SOX compliance, um, ISO 27.1 compliance, to name just a few. Governance points towards integrating role-based access, defining who can do what on the platform, together with Azure policies, what are the services I can deploy on the platform and where. That's in short what governance is about. You could also have a look at Azure landing zones. What are landing zones? It's another set of guidance blueprints allowing you to um, get started pretty fast following the reference architectures. So one example, uh, pre-integrating governance. So it's a full set of recommended RBAC and Azure policies together with cross-management subscription, management groups, or deploying a hub spoke model that allows you to build out enterprise-ready networking. Another important one is also integrating deployments across different environments. What is a different environment? The, the traditional one, you could say, Dev and test Q&A production, but also Canary early adopter, blue-green deployment, um, A-B testing, dark launching. Those are some of the different environments you could deploy. Where Dev and test is probably still quite familiar to a lot of you, Canary early adopter means that you're going to deploy uh, a, an unfinished product. Think of it as the, the Windows 11 preview, um, allowing you to join a specific uh, team, specific group within Microsoft as well as feeding feedback from the communities, allowing you to test preview features, meaning the product is not 100% production ready yet, but you already gonna use it in a sort of production mindset. Where Canary is typically like the, the beta version, the internal previews are typically alpha version, and then the early adopter is following after Canary, where you're also gonna integrate a small subset of users, 5%, 10%, typically in a Canary deploy, early adopter about 25 to 50%, and then eventually a few weeks, few months after, you're gonna release the, the, the fully tested, fully bug-free um, or bug-optimized um, production-ready version. And then also that's where SRE and DevOps are nicely working together, automating your deployments as much as possible. Why? Because DevOps allows you to automate. Next to that, it allows you to mitigate human error. It also allows you to integrate security end-to-end out of the, the SAC DevOps um, concepts. And then last closing with um, the, the part where I started with out of SRE, you cannot know if you don't see. So that's where the monitoring comes in, the, the, the management capabilities are coming in and defining end-to-end -end monitoring for your workloads. All the way from deployment, over running it, migrating it, revising it, source control, deployments out of DevOps, and once the workload is running, continuously revising, updating where needed. And then just one example that I would like to share here is what you can do around an Azure mission critical workload. This is just an example. There's a link to the docs as well. It also provides you a full end-to-end -end Azure template using DevOps, using GitHub, I think, allowing you to deploy. But in short, what it's about, you're gonna use Let me focus a little bit on some building blocks. You're going to start with source control. Source control can be GitHub, can be Azure repos. Automation can be Azure pipelines, can be GitHub actions. So again, it's not really about the tooling. By the way, I provided um, another session earlier this month on the Azure Back to School platform here, talking about the, the differences or the core differences between Azure DevOps and GitHub and not really about one being better than the other, but actually focusing on how to integrate those two worlds together. So feel free to um, go back in the YouTube list and grab that session. From there, you're gonna build your infrastructure where we run an infra deployment using infrastructure as code. Can be Azure ARM templates, can be Bicep, can be Terraform. That would be like the technology behind it. From there, this is just an example, we're gonna focus on a containerized workload running inside a Kubernetes cluster where the Kubernetes cluster is running in multiple regions. 
And again, if you go like, oh, wait a minute, Peter, I'm not doing anything with containers. Does it mean I'm doing it wrong? Obviously not at all. You can do the same with deploying web apps, um, app services across different regions, adding load balancers on top. You can deploy your underlying database backend, whether it's virtual machines, um, SQL cluster, MySQL cluster, Postgres as a service, um, Azure SQL as a service, Cosmos database, so a lot of different options there. So don't focus too much on the fact that this sample workload, that's why it's a sample, is about containers. It doesn't need to be containers. That's the key message. Then adding our global load balancers on top. This one is using Frontdoor together with Web Application Firewall. If you don't need all the features from Frontdoor, like mainly security rerouting, URL redirections, you could also use Traffic Manager. And then some database, Cosmos DB, or again, any other database, that would be the main message. And then crucial is the monitoring part where you're gonna watch over the different services. You're gonna watch over AKS using the AKS metrics, using Prometheus Grafana, for example, the ones I already talked about. And you're gonna rely on log analytics together with application insights to get a real deep insight of your actual running workloads. And again, just a sample. It's not that all of a sudden, all your workloads need to follow this architecture. I think with that, it's about time to switch to another demo where I'm gonna walk you through some key characteristics of the well-architected framework, how to run an assessment and what the outcome could look like, showing you the capabilities of Traffic Manager as one of the global load balancing scenarios and focusing on one specific feature of Application Insights, showing you what availability tests can help you with from a reliability perspective. So let's move on and show you a little bit about well-architected framework and some of the high available reliable workloads, Traffic Manager and Application Insights availability. But before that, since I talked about Azure Mission Critical Workload, uh, this is what it's about. This is what you can find. And it's fully open source, so you can connect to GitHub slash Azure slash Mission Critical. And what it provides you is that sample workload, so the full high available load balancing, the Kubernetes clusters, Azure Container Services, pretty much everything to allow you to test, to validate, and controlling how the workload will run in a reliable state. So there's quite a lot of documentation around it. What is mission critical? Why did um, the team build this? What could you expect from running it in your environment? Starting from source control, where you can um, run a git clone comment or, or literally downloading as a zip file, running everything on your local machine. And then within the docs, that's where you're gonna find the actual architectural building blocks. What is the architecture pattern that they're using? How to integrate the application design, the data platform, so it's a multi-tier application. How to run the deployment and testing, how to validate networking, pretty much everything. So the um, idea again would be to uh, clone this repo and run the deployments in your own environment. You could use Azure DevOps to do that. You could also use GitHub Actions and the pipelines are provided as part of the um, GitHub repo. The well-architected framework as well. So as mentioned, it's part of our Azure Docs and you can connect to slash architecture slash framework. The five different pillars, reliability, security, cost, operational excellence, and performance. So if you wanna find out more about a well-architected framework, I would say this is really your landing page. You could start with the about, you could read the design testing monitoring, what it's about, what do I need, how is it running? And again, showing you a quite extensive overview. There's a couple of videos from David here, allowing you to, again, learn more about well-architected framework, following the different diagrams, where it fits in the rest of your DevOps journey, if you want, or in your site reliability journey. And again, a whole bunch of videos about specific services. The other thing you can do is running that um, assessment, right? So this is just a, an example that I'm quickly gonna walk you through. It takes you quite some time to go through all pillars, about 30 to 60 minutes. But in short, what it allows you to do is focusing on different workload types. So let's do core well-architected review here. 
I'm going to focus on reliability and the idea is that you going to answer the different questions and based on the answer it's going to provide you an assessment outcome. Nothing blocks you from skipping specific questions but obviously the more granular the more correct you're going to answer the questions the, the more accurate the assessment will be and all the way at the end it's also going to show you like this is your health state around architect framework um, this is where we detect optimizations or room for improvement around um, security reliability performance any of the the five pillars so that's um, what the well architected framework is about the other part that i wanted to show you is just one quick example on running a high available workload so one example is traffic manager although you could also use Azure Front Door, it's a global load balancing service where Traffic Manager allows you to load balance about any workload type. So I'm using web apps, but it can be virtual machines, can be scale sets, can be um, pretty much anything like even the Azure Virtual Desktop would be a good example. In my scenario, I run my web applications in three different regions, so literally going for ultimate high availability across different regions because I got my users connecting from all the different regions. Now to provide load balancing, I created my traffic manager profile and within traffic manager, I'm defining the different endpoints, obviously reflecting my Azure endpoints over here where each and every of my web apps are pointing to a specific endpoint. Traffic manager allows you to define different load balancing mechanisms you could go for priority you could use round robin you could um, go for regional preference so anyone connecting from the us will get redirected to a us running workload or apac or europe that would be the idea so allow me to connect to my traffic manager where my web app is running with an internal certificate Let's see where it ends up. There we go. This is my web application. Nothing too fancy, just a, a little static page. I'm connecting to West US. So let's go back into my app services. And for example, stopping West US, like simulating an outage, you could say. Gonna filter a little bit in my subscriptions. And we had West US as a workload. And just for the fun of it, we're gonna stop it. Way cool. So it is stopped where now, obviously, if I go back into my traffic manager, it's going to tell me that it stopped. Now, maybe not something you're expecting. Now, the reason why it's showing this is because it's a DNS based load balancer. DNS relies on a time to live. And what you have with a time to live is obviously a little bit of a delay. So to speed it up a little bit, allow me to open up a new browser session where I'm again connecting, oh, and it's already there. So even in another browser session, but I didn't need to do that, it's already coming up in West Europe. So pretty, um, pretty nice. That's in short what Traffic Manager is gonna help you with, but know that it's gonna take about um, 30 seconds before it's actually redirecting. But for a typical end user, they shouldn't really have any problems with that. And then last, Application Insights Availability Manager or Availability Testing. What you need to do here is creating a new test. So first of all, you deploy the workload, you deploy Application Insights, standard Azure services, there's nothing too hard about it. And you're gonna provide some details on how you wanna run the test. The URL for the workload can run in Azure, can run outside of Azure. Defining what happens with um, SSL certificates, TLS certificates, and the frequency of the tests as well as the location. 
Once this is defined, you're gonna run the test for a little bit and the outcome is what you see over here. So although my workload is technically deployed in one single region, it's running in the US, it allows you to test connectivity from different locations. And again, you can specify from um, which ones. So as you can see here, over the last 20 minutes, I didn't run the tests that long, but over the last 20 minutes, it's gonna show me that availability is about 100%. So it's 100% high available. Next to that, I can see over here that in total, so not the last 20 minutes, but in total, it's been running about 1500 tests over the last 24 hours. And here on the site, it's gonna show me the details where luckily for each and every region, everything is up and running. And then finally, you can drill down and this is default application insights behavior. You can get a view on the testing that happened, like what is the HTTP um, feedback. And looking at my blog website over here, business critical workload, obviously it is, where it's gonna show you the test duration and pinging the server. You could say validating, hey server, are you still there? And from there connecting. Now the magic behind this is application insights running that application availability testing. Cool. Um, next part, site reliability engineering is not site reliability engineering without testing your availability of your environment. So the first part up till now is about the planning phase, the architecting phase, the realization phase where we're gonna use DevOps um, concepts, Azure DevOps, GitHub Actions, those kind of pipeline tools. But next to that, it's also about how solid is my environment running? What do we need is fault injection. What is fault injection in the IT industry? It's chaos engineering. Chaos engineering was originally developed, invented, you could say by Netflix, where they used a product, they actually built a product in-house called Chaos Monkey. Chaos Monkey allowed them to inject virtual machine faults like um, CPU load, memory load, um, shutting down a virtual machine and figuring out what is the impact on my workload. So the official terminology here coming from principles of chaos, which to me could be um, like a metal band or something. Chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a system, like you're gonna try stuff out in order to build confidence, meaning we're gonna try and hammer the server. That's what we're doing. Or not just a server, it could be containers, could be web apps, could be databases, could be firewalls, anything that you're running as part of your broader application landscape. So getting um, confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions. And super crucial, we're talking about production environments. So in short, Peter's definition of chaos engineering, knocking yourself out in bringing down a server, bringing down a web app, bringing down any application component that's already running in production. And it's not just having fun in breaking it down, but it's obviously more important to learn from it. Now on a lower level, there's two different scenarios I would like to highlight in chaos engineering. It's what I call the curious case of CPU pressure. What do I mean by that? CPU pressure exists in a virtual machine where you might have more visitors, more users connecting to um, your web workload, where obviously the more demand, the more CPU load comes in. This could be a database service, this could be a web workload, but it also reflects an individual DevOps engineer. There's only so much work you can ask from anyone to do, and that's where we have a second curious case of CPU pressure. What do I mean by that? It's where in the previous design, it's like a, a standalone something going wrong. We're gonna test a server, we're gonna test a web application, we're gonna hammer a database, but in real life, all components, all application architectural building blocks are nicely working together. If you look at a traditional way of working with an application, there is CPU load. Why? Because we have more users, more customers connecting to, I don't know, our e-commerce um, workload. Maybe there was um, like an online e-commerce website available before the pandemic and having 500 visitors every hour and 50 orders coming out of that. Awesome. But then overnight during the pandemic, like two years and a half ago, like in my case out of Belgium, we had what we call the lockdown. And obviously Belgium was not the only place. So that's where 
we were not allowed to go to the stores anymore. Physical restaurants needed to close down. And what we saw was that in order to still get our products, we could only go online. That's the curious case of CPU pressure in the second example. There's a huge amount of impact, not just on a database server, not just on a web server, but it is on your application workload architecture. CPU goes up on the web server because the database is slowing down. There's performance impact on the network because you got more users coming in. There's impact on the network because nobody's connecting from within the network inside the office, but connecting remote. We need to provide a VPN solution and so on and so on. That's like the complexity we're talking about in a site reliability engineering setup. Or looking at the individuals, like the, the uh, site reliability engineers themselves, all of a sudden, instead of nicely working together, following the DevOps culture concept, you need to still work together, collaborate, but all of a sudden you need to work remote and maybe even remote across different regions. So it's not just about the technical challenges in keeping workloads up and running, but also about the team itself, keeping the team up and running as well. So now you know all this, it is like, is Chaos Engineering DevOps 3.0. Why 3.0? Because it's not 2.0, what I already talked about before, but initially we had Agile together with Itil, right? As the, the services mindset. After Agile, we talked about DevOps. Then we talked about site reliability engineering, where it's DevOps 2.0, yes or no? You already know the answer there. So what about Chaos Engineering? Does it mean Chaos Engineering is DevOps 3.0? Well, yes and no, but hold on. First, about the tooling. If you want to integrate Chaos Engineering inside your Azure platform, I would say definitely have a look at the currently public preview features of Azure Chaos Studio. Chaos Engineering as a service, you don't need to deploy anything. You don't need to install anything. You just go through Azure Chaos Studio as a service. You deploy it, and from there, you can start hammering your Azure running workloads. And yes, I know the definition says it's production targeting, but obviously you can run this against dev and test subscriptions, less uh, production focused subscriptions or resources. You probably get that idea. And it allows you to test virtual machines, network security groups like injecting um, NSG firewalling rules, or maybe removing them and validating what's the impact on my workload, targeting specific Kubernetes clusters, and also simulating regional Azure outages. The core technology behind it is what we call chaos experiments. A chaos experiment can be a service direct or can be agent-based. Agent-based is where you're gonna deploy an agent on virtual machines, Windows and Linux, and they will run the tasks to bring down your servers. Service direct is what you would use for NSGs, for Key Vault, for Kubernetes clusters. A little bit more on the chaos experiments. So it's a step-by-step -step scenario where within each step, you're gonna define a branch where a branch reflects um, a step, like a, a specific task to be performed. So what's the idea? We have our curious case of CPU pressure. So what we can do is injecting a fault inside our um, virtual machine chaos engineering target, where we're gonna simulate CPU load or we're gonna run CPU load together with memory load, together with firewall updates. So that's where the different branches are coming in. That's what you're gonna do. And then all the way at the end, you can reuse all the different steps, all the different branches across different selectors. So it's not that there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. You can reuse different steps and branches across different selectors, where the selector is your target um, environment. Run CPU load testing across my Kubernetes cluster run CPU testing across virtual machines that I'm running in three different regions. That's the main idea. And the nice thing is that each and every experiment is nothing more than another Azure resource. So there's some automation possible using ARM templates as well. So this is my um, Azure environment where I already enabled Chaos Studio. And again, if you don't really know how to do that, you go into your subscriptions And within your subscriptions, you're going to search for resource providers. So go a little bit down here. 
into the resource provider section. And that's where you literally enable the, the um, Azure Fabric features of the platform, where you're gonna search for chaos. And in my case, obviously, because otherwise I could not really demo anything, you're gonna click that register option here on top, giving it a couple of seconds, worst case, a few minutes. And from there, once it's a green registered option, it means you can start using your chaos environment or the Chaos Studio service, I should say. So let's jump back to Chaos Studio. And the first thing we're gonna do is defining a target. Now a target is again, anything that's already running in your environment, quite important, it needs to be up and running. The reason why is because you need to define how you're gonna manage your target. As you can see here, I got two scenarios already enabled. I have my Ubuntu Linux virtual machine where I can manage actions. And the second scenario I got is my AKS cluster. Now you can see that there are a lot of other scenarios available. I can literally target my virtual machine scale set. Over here, I can test against an NSG. I don't have an example for app services, although technically you can actually stop um, the app service itself. The virtual machine is pretty obvious, but also validating interactions against um, like a key vault in this case. So it's not just about virtual machines, it's not just about Kubernetes, but it's um, expanding the target environments. So how do we install that agent, right? That would be the next step, where again, you got service direct and you have agent-based. So for a virtual machine, you're probably gonna go for agent-based. So it's nothing harder than selecting your target virtual machine, going up here, enable target. And since again, it's a VM, we're gonna install that package. The next step, what you need is a managed identity. Now, what is a managed identity, right? When you deploy Chaos Studio for the first time, you need to create that managed identity. If you don't really know the details, a managed identity is an Azure ED service principle, like a, a security object, allowing you interaction from one Azure service Azure Chaos Studio in this case, to interact with other parts of the platform. Virtual machines, NSGs, Kubernetes clusters, um, app services, uh, Redis Cache, Cosmos DB, and, and so many other services. So that would be step one. I already created my managed identity. Where important, it's a managed identity for the Chaos Studio service. It's not a managed identity for the virtual machine that you're gonna use as a target. Second dependency component is application insights. So again, you already know, we need application insights for our observability, like providing the metrics, sharing you the output, where you need to dive in your Azure portal, or again, using some automation engine, Terraform, PowerShell, Azure CLI, doesn't really matter. And you're gonna deploy your application inside um, service. From there, you just need to define which one you wanna use, and as you can see, I got quite a lot of them because I'm taking monitoring quite serious and we're gonna enable it as well. And that's all it takes. Where from here, it's gonna install that agent. Now to speed up my demo a little bit, I already have this for my Ubuntu VM. And you can validate your deployment. You don't really have to wait in the portal to just validate what's going on but it's nothing more than any traditional extension. So maybe you're already familiar with using Chef, Puppet, some anti-malware scenario like Microsoft Defender and installing it as an extension, like adding a little piece of software like an agent inside your virtual machine, where my portal seems to not be refreshing. Let's try that again. There we go. So I got my chaos engineering and provisioning succeeded. Again, this takes just a couple of minutes, but I didn't really want to wait to show you how it works on the web VM itself. Keep in mind, if it's a Linux backend, you need to install that chaos ng package inside your cluster as well. And again, you could probably find out how to do that using um, the traditional virtual machine approach for your Linux, like a apt get, uh, depending a bit on the, the Linux flavor you're using would be a good option. So what we have right now is our target. 
we have the virtual machines defined. And if you want, we could also go back where the deployment is still running, totally fine. Taking a little step back to my Chaos Studio. Where now I could target the similar concept, but using a different service. So I'm going to give it a couple of seconds before it's pulling up the capable or, or compatible resources and maybe like uh, using my Cosmos database where this time I'm going to enable it for a direct service model, which means I don't need to deploy an agent. That's really how easy it is. It's going to flip back, but we're not going to wait for it. You probably get the idea how to do that. Where the next step is defining an experiment. I already have a, a few experiments up and running that I'm going to reuse just to, again, keep it a little bit entertaining, not wasting time on a lot of stuff happening in the back end. But nothing blocks me from showing you how to create a new experiment. So once you have this, it's opening up an experiment um, configuration. So interesting enough, an experiment by itself is nothing more than a standalone Azure resource. It also means that you can um, automate the deployment using ARM templates bicep to just give you an example. And we're going to call this the Lord Chaos experiment. My targets are running in central US, but in the end, it's not really that important. But I typically like uh, deploying my experiments in the same region where I'm going to run my testing or going to run my engineering um, experiment itself. From here, as I outlined in the presentation, the highest level is a step. Within the step, you got a branch. And out of the branch, you're going to define a fault, where a fault can be multiple actions. You can totally customize the step one branch name and adding multiple branches. I'm going to keep it a little bit easy for now because I don't want to run over time and just focusing on creating a new fault. Where a fault is, I would say based on a, a library of fault injections where a lot of them are already available. And if needed, you can insert some custom ones out of a fault library that I'll show you in a minute. Now, since we have different target endpoints, it means that we can go for different um, fault scenarios. A couple of obvious ones like validating the shutdown of a virtual machine or shutting down the full scale set and finding out like what's the impact for my application workload. Specifically targeting Cosmos DB, where again, I didn't need to deploy an agent. It's that direct uh, service direct model. And I can start hammering my Cosmos DB, running a failover from one region to another, uh, shutting down, moving, moving down the, the RUs, the, the request units and causing some kind of latency. And again, testing how my web front end is responding to that, right? A nice list of AKS specific um, scenarios where again, all of them are based on that open source chaos mesh scenario. And then from there, a whole collection of standalone ones. Let me change the color to just highlight that it's slightly different. Interacting with Key Vault, like not giving you access to find your secrets, uh, certificates anymore. CPU pressure, physical memory testing, virtual memory, CPU load, stopping a service, killing a process, and so many other scenarios available. So let's check out what that fault library is about. So in the official Microsoft docs, there's a pretty long list of potential faults and specific actions that you can use. Now, the way it works for like the, the easier tasks or the easier fault validations that I talked about, you can just select it and you don't really have to do anything. But you might also end up in a more um, complex scenario. Like, for example, CPU pressure, quite easy to understand what it's going to do. And it doesn't really require a lot of settings. Now, what you need is a JSON file. You could have um, like an open source library, again, like Chaos Mesh, giving you um, YAML syntax for Kubernetes environments we're now out of that um, AKS specific chaos engineering testing that we offer out of Chaos Studio in Azure. You need to translate the YAML files into JSON. And that's also documented in this article. Don't worry too much about where to find that fault library. You have that link in the Chaos Studio portal. And I also have it in my slides all the way at the end. 
Good. So let's go back to our scenario and we're going to simulate like a CPU pressure. Well, now I can define some of my settings, right? I'm going to run this for, let's say, 10 minutes and I'm going to hammer my server with 99% CPU. Don't ask me why it's not possible to select 100, 100%, but you probably get the idea because once it reaches 100% CPU, it's typically crashing the server. Next, we're going to define the target resource where I'm going to hammer my Ubuntu and the WebVM. So the nice thing here is that you can run the same performance testing against multiple endpoints. Could be the same server workload, could be different ones. Like my WebVM is running my web engine. My Ubuntu VM is running um, a MySQL Postgres database. And I'm going to test the behavior when I'm hammering my server with a CPU loads. And that's literally all it takes. If you want, you can add a delay, like testing something for like a few minutes. After that, waiting a couple of minutes, testing it again, waiting a few minutes, testing it again. So that's um, another, maybe more complex scenario. And then adding an additional step is nothing more than doing the same thing. Where again, it's going to run through that step-by-step -step scenario, running through that sequence, where let's say for now, we're going to um, kill a process and the process name is called cmd.exe. Not the most fancy one, but again, this could be like any super important business critical workload where you're just going to stop and kill that process. That's the idea. Where next, while my CPU load is hammering, I'm going to trigger some other process stop. And again, from here, you can add multiple steps, making it more complex, integrating the time waiting um, scenario. You probably get that idea. From here, you review, create, that's basically it. Now, again, I already ran this process and what I have is a CPU experiments and then later on, I got something for my AKS cluster as well. Good. Now, from here, we have Chaos Studio. We enable the service in the platform. Next, we define target direct service or using that agent-based deployment. Step number three, we defined experiments as easy or as complex as you want it, targeting a single step with a single fault to a single VM or any single um, target object or making it more complex, more, um, yeah, more complex. Adding VM scale sets, um, web apps, testing Kubernetes clusters and anything else that I already talked about. Now from here, the next step is obviously triggering an experiment. Now, before this is capable of kicking off, you need to define role-based access permissions. You need to provide the correct permissions. And interesting enough, it only needs reader permissions. So there's no real security uh, validation, I would say, uh, or security violation, actually better, where the, the CPU experiment by itself is becoming an Azure standalone resource which means it has a service principle in the back and we need to define RBAC permissions. Defining read RBAC, role-based access, for my PDT CPU experiment towards that specific resource. So we go into our target scenario, in this case, my Ubuntu VM. We go into access control. And from there, we're going to define that my PDT CPU experiment gets reader permissions. So we're going to add new role assignment. The reader permissions is all it needs. And we're going to specify the member where my member is PDT CPU experiment. That should be able to find something. Well, not for now, for some weird reason, but you probably get the idea. I'm not going to um, wait for it. So now the next step is running your testing. And as you can see, I got a few other ones from other demos that I did. And some of them are failed. Some of them are successful. So we're obviously aiming for successful ones. So what I'm going to do here is kicking it off, starting my process to just show you like what it's about. 
it's going to move this into a uh, chaos studio processing queue so nothing really to wait for and while it is running you can validate the details looks like my portal is running behind a little bit now here it tells me because i was not able to actually define that RBAC. It's literally going to tell me like too bad it's not working. I don't have permissions to run this, which is totally fine. I mean, I explicitly wanted to show you, but I can go back to another task and showing you the outcome of it. The exact same scenario, I simulated uh, CPU pressure running a CPU testing during 10, um, 10 minutes. So you can nicely see here it started 446 and it finished. 456 and it ran for about 10 minutes and the outcome is complete now the part that i cannot really show you but you should probably um yeah find out that you could go back to your azure monitor could go back to log analytics going to your virtual machine if you want to run this live and validating where you go into the metrics checking the cpu load and seeing that the cpu is spiking up to like 99 percent and then after 10 minutes, it's totally dropping back. And at the same time, and that's obviously more important, you're going to validate the impact on your workload. Another scenario for um, my AKS cluster, why not, is first of all, defining your Chaos Studio, we already did, defining the target agent list, so the direct service option, and creating an experiment. Where what I did with this one, is defining a step where I'm going to run a predefined chaos mesh. So that open sourced library, the family of, of uh, the library that I showed you earlier in the docs and just grabbing one of those parameters where you can see here parts of that JSON. And I don't really know if it's related to the preview, but if I go into edit mode, it's not going to show me the details of that JSON. So that's something I, um, I noticed while going through the configuration that from here, it's not really, I would say, publishing, showing you the details of that JSON file um, experiment. So maybe something to keep in mind during your preview testing to copy your fold library snippets um, aside if you don't just want to rely on what's already available over here in that um, fold library. If you want to spin up um, a new one, so what I could do here is testing my pots and grabbing one of those JSON files. So that's literally what I did. And you can see it down here. So let's run this experiment as well. We're going to start it, going to kick it off. And the best way to validate your running pots and how they're behaving is running cube control, right? You can validate a little bit of it using Azure Monitor as well. But why not showing you cube control, get pods. We're now out of my experiment. It should run some of my pods and some other ones are getting stopped. So that's literally what we're testing here. So I can see that already in, in just a couple of minutes, it's terminating and it is restarting once where the other ones, because there's a little bit of time I kept in between the recording of kicking off the task and moving to the behavior of the pods, where you can see that I'm literally stopping a pod, starting it again, stopping it, starting it again. That's um, the main scenario we're testing. I'm only running one note in the backend, but you probably get the idea from here. We're almost there where I touched on DevOps as an integration, as a means for site reliability engineering as well. So what we're going to do is relying on our DevOps tool. Yes, I know I'm using Azure DevOps as an example, but forget for a second about Azure DevOps. Why am I using Azure DevOps? Because there are a few specific capabilities, characteristics inside Azure DevOps called Azure DevOps release gates or quality gates is what some other DevOps tools are calling them and allowing you to inject some sort of faults, but also intelligence out of your um, Azure DevOps environment. So for example, but I got a demo on that, you can define pre and post intelligence, like maybe waiting for an approval. Why would we run a deployment if my manager is not deploying it? Why is not approving it, right? 
why would we run a pipeline if the business doesn't want to pay for it? So that could be the um, approval. Next to that, as you can see here, this is just a, a basic um, scenario that I have in my demo environment. It allows you to validate for example, against Azure policies. An easy example I have here is validating a specific Azure region. If let's say your Azure pipeline allows you to deploy something in central US or West Europe or anywhere else in an Azure region or AWS or Google Cloud or uh, Red Hat OpenShift, the target environment doesn't really matter and your Azure policies are blocking you from accepting the deployment. So why would you run that deployment in the first place? That's like the, the main message. That's what release gates are preventing you from. Or integrating any custom REST API may be triggering an Azure function to again validate like what's going on with my backend platform. Will it guarantee a successful pipeline run? Yes or no. Or interacting with Azure Monitor. If you're familiar with Azure Monitor log analytics, you probably know that you can define alerts. What you can do here with release gates in by the way, classic and YAML pipelines is reading out Azure Monitor alerts. If there is an alert coming out of the platform, it's gonna trigger or maybe explicitly not trigger a pipeline run. That's the idea. And then last, well, pre-last query work items is where you can go back to your DevOps um, baseline, integrating with Azure Boards, the project management, and maybe querying how many bugs Peter has in the application that we're about to publish here. And if there's more than 50 bucks open, we're not even allowing Peter to run that deployment. And then another example I could show you is integrating with Sonar Cloud. If you don't know what Sonar Cloud is, it's uh, one of the so many DevOps tools, not just Azure DevOps, it's available across different DevOps platforms, but it allows you to perform source control code scanning, vulnerability scanning. So what it does is when you have um, development source code, integrating with packages, integrating Docker containers, you should know that there is a best practice to run a security code scanning. Based on the outcome, like how secure is the code, how safe is it to use it, that's what Sonar Cloud is gonna help you with here, like again, allowing you or blocking the deployments. So looking at a, a few examples, apart from what I already mentioned, you could move towards a scenario where a pipeline is ready to be deployed, but it's not deploying because there is no Azure alert. But once there is an Azure alert coming up, that might be the trigger to actually run the pipeline. And that's how you achieve SRE. You're gonna make your workloads more reliable, deploying something in another region, but only when that other region or the prime region, I should say, is not available anymore. Or maybe it's still available, but not for the full 100% or not according the um, SLO, SLI that you put forward and relying on DevOps to integrate that automation. And that's what I'm gonna show you in this next demo. So in this demo, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the release gates or quality gates from within Azure DevOps. So the scenario is that you have um, a release and I'm using the, the classic interface, but later on I'll show you how you can do the same from within uh, YAML pipeline. So out of my releases, I created two sample pipelines over here where I'm gonna integrate Azure Monitor validation and integrating policies. So let's have a look at the monitoring one. So the default or the, the starting point is running your release pipeline just like any other pipeline. So there's no real difference there. So what I'm doing here is connecting to Azure, creating some resources, creating a SQL resource, a resource group, uh, a database, an app services resource, running CLI to import and eventually relying on a classic uh, template pipeline uh, task using the app service deployment and all the way at the end overriding my database connection string to make sure that my app service can nicely connect to my database. So nothing too hard. The magic comes in with the post and pre release gate validations. So what we can do here, let me do um, a pre-validation, is checking, for example, if there's an issue with Azure Monitor. So what you need to do to make this work is going into Azure Monitor alerts, defining whatever alert you want, and what it's gonna do here before running the release pipeline 
it's going to check like, hey, Azure Monitor, do you have an alert for me? During um, every five minutes and 24 hours, it's going to loop through Azure Monitor, reading out information. And based on obviously the state of your Azure platform, it's going to allow you to block the deployment or run it. Now, the outcome of that, if I take one step back and show you once you run this pipeline, what it looks like. As long as you do have alerts open in your environment over here, it's not going to do anything. So every five minutes and don't worry too much about the timing that I used here to create the demo, but um, it was quite early in the morning or quite late at night, as you can see. And if we're looking within each and every state, it's technically running an Azure REST API call to the management.azure.com. So the, it's a little bit of, I would say, reverse logic. So what it does here is running a REST API call to the alerts, connecting to the um, API alerts, alerts API, I should say. And from there, it's waiting for feedback. So it's going to check any severity, uh, severity four in this case. And as long as there's an alert available, like um, I don't remember what exactly what happened here, but at least I flagged it. Um, there was something wrong in the region because a virtual machine that connects to my web application workload was not running. So what's the point of actually deploying the web app? That would be the mindset. And as long as the outcome is zero or not equals to zero, you could say, then it's not going to deploy it. That happened over the last three iterations and then all the way at the end, a successful one where the response is checking that alert API. There is no alert. That's the response, which means green light for running the deployment. Pretty cool stuff. Another example is about the same, but this time integrating with Azure policy. So what I created is um, a policy where I'm not allowed to deploy something in a specific Azure region. Out of my template deployment, so creating CLI steps, creating the Azure Web App, I'm trying to publish to that specific region where obviously, although my pipeline is going to kick off successfully, Azure policy is going to block me from deploying it because it doesn't matter what tool you're using to deploy, Azure policy will block that deployment. And that's what happened here. So it's about the same. It's going to validate the different endpoints. So connecting to Microsoft Policy Insight. And whenever there's um, something coming up for a specific resource group, if you want. So it's quite dynamic on how you assign your policies or policy initiatives. And as long as there's a problem, like a, a detected policy validation, it's not allowing you to run that deployment. And then once you clean up your policy, like in this case, what I did is allowing the deployment to that specific region for that specific resource group. And five minutes after, it's nicely running the deployment. Or the work items integration, why not? Need to go back to another view. So we talked about boards. We talked about the work items. And what you can do here is once more creating a new release where the post uh, pre steps, sorry, allow you to run a query against the work items. So you need to go into your Azure boards. You need to go into work item queries, creating a query. I checked for Peter open items. There we go. And every five minutes out of the pipeline release run, it's going to check. Hey, do you have any open issues by running that work item query. If I have a specific amount of items open, it's not just having one. You can obviously define how many items or even filtering on a specific item type. That's going to allow you to run the pipeline or blocking the pipeline. Now, this was based on classic, right? Now, you can do the same in YAML pipelines, but it's slightly different. What you need to configure, first of all, is an environment. It's nothing too hard. So you go into your environment, create a new environment, you give it a name. And what you get out of that is over here, validating approvals and checks. So it's a little bit different. 
But once you go into approvals, it's going to allow you to run about the same as the screenshot and, and the live demo I just showed you. Interacting your YAML pipelines with Azure Monitor alerts, validating REST API calls. As you can see, Azure policy is not showing up here, but if you know how to do that using traditional Azure REST API calls, maybe running a function, that would be the scenario and the traditional approvals like uh, somebody needs to approve the pipeline run would also still be available. And then last, once you defined your settings and you defined your approval steps, the only thing you need is updating one line of code environment, pointing at the name of the environment and using that in your YAML syntax. That's pretty much it um, out of this part of the demo. Cool, so we're almost there, we're almost at the end of the session. And one last thing that I promised you at the start is a lot of what I talked about in this session is available in an upcoming book. It should be available early October and it's called The Art of Site Reliability Engineering with Azure. Now, if you look at the name up here, why am I promoting a book that I didn't write? I would say, um, I'm not gonna spoil the fun, Get the book, it will be available as a paper version, obviously a uh, Kindle version, another online e-reading version, whatever you like, on the APRES website, on Amazon, on a lot of different um, publishing websites. And if you want to find out why I'm talking about the book, but why the book is not having my name as the author, you can find that in the foreword of the book. With that, I'm going to close out. This was my session, Achieving SRE with Azure. My name is Peter Detender, Azure Technical Trainer at Microsoft. Thanks for having me, Dwayne and Derek, in the Azure Back to School series this month of September. If you've got any questions, comments, or you want to share feedback about the session I presented, feel free to reach out on Twitter, PDTIT, aka.ms slash PDTIT for my technical blog. And if you've got questions you want to send by email, that would be petender at Microsoft.com. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the Azure Back to School.